All right. Well, let's get started. Hi, Dr. C. How are you? Hey, Rena. I'm doing great. Glad to be here with you. So let's get started with why did you write the book? What inspired you? Now, you, you've already got so many bestsellers. You didn't need to write another book, right? You know, I didn't, but this was a story that I hadn't heard that had gotten out and hadn't gotten the light of day that it deserves. You know, I'm glad you're doing a lot of work talking about liver, but this needs more attention. Um, my personal struggle that brought me into this was related to my weight and my health. And, you know, it led me down a path of treating thyroid disease, hormone conditions. But I saw that there was a lot of unmet need for people who are struggling with, still was struggling with just sorting out their weight. And it seemed like they always had to choose between you know, getting their weight what they wanted or feeling well. And I saw there was this core issue that was behind both of those things I wanted to help sort out for people. So what is the science behind the book that you've written? You know, the basic idea is that when your body works right, it keeps things in balance for you and you're not having to think about it or worry about it. And by things that keep in balance, I would argue that people are always trying to make a trade off between good energy, reasonable appetite, and then healthy body weight. And it comes down to your liver managing fuel. You know, when it works well, it will supply fuel out of your stores and, you know, keep the lights on, keep you energized, keep your brain sharp. But when it doesn't work well, it can't keep energy levels up. At the same time, it's storing too much fuel that's locked up and it gets jammed in the organ, it goes around the organ, and it causes just tons of symptoms and health complications. Let's dive into chapter one, which is your mysterious metabolism. Why is it mysterious? And first of all, what the heck is the metabolism anyway? Because I think there's different definitions um, depending on who you talk to. You know, the basic thing about the metabolism is just how your body generates energy, how your body generates fuel. And there's a lot of talk fixating on whether it's fast or slow. I talk more about a metabolism being flexible. You know, right now we're, we're talking, we're, we're using energy in our brains and, and to keep our bodies in position, keep our bodies warm, we're using energy for those purposes, but we're not consuming any source of energy in this exact moment. So when you've got a good metabolism, your body can maintain that. And the intake of fuel that your body converts into energy will never perfectly match what your needs are in a moment or in a day. It's never going to sync up. And when things work well, that's fine. You know, your liver can store the excess and access it later on. And that's a flexible metabolism. If you're a bit over your food needs, you know, no consequence. Your liver makes some, some triglycerides, some glycogen, and it holds on to that for later in ways that are harmless. And if there's less than you consume, you consume less than you need, your liver draws that out. But what happens is that people hit a state where their liver can't effectively do that any longer. You know, a small amount of extra food becomes fluid retention and weight gain, like dramatic weight gain. Mm -hmm. And anytime there's a deficit, the liver can't pull out and can't create energy to sustain the body's needs. So that's, that's a lack of metabolic flexibility. Pretty much most everything besides infectious and accidental death falls into those categories. And wow. you can make an argument by which infectious disease is more prevalent or more severe in those that are metabolically compromised. You could also make an argument that Absolutely. accidental issues are more, more of Absolutely. a risk, you know, when your brain's not at its best. So it's pretty much everything that goes wrong. And the core central issue, there's a group of chemicals called adipokines that certain toxic fat cells generate. And seriously, they set the stage for all these metabolic complications. And we're starting to find that these metabolic diseases are on a, you know, huge tipping point upwards. Why is that? Why didn't we have these metabolic diseases and this metabolism issue decades ago? What are we doing wrong that's triggering this in all of us? You know, great point. And of those various conditions, yeah, they're on the increase. The one that's like running ahead of all of it is, is liver disease and fatty liver disease. And that's on a continuum from situations that no one would even be aware of all the way up to hepatocellular carcinomas, cirrhosis, the worst manifestations of it. It's the fastest uptick of all these chronic conditions. And, and it's the least well-known, right? It's the least well-known. It's, boy, it, it affects so many people. You know, we, there's the overt forms that have been diagnosed or that are diagnosable. And that's probably about 30 to 40% of adults or like about 100 million in America. Wow. 
So then there's this subclinical form to where it's at a level to where you wouldn't overtly diagnose it. And the tough part about fatty liver is that there's various ways that a doctor can say it is present, that we can rule it in, but there's really no good ways a doctor can rule it out and definitively say you do not have it. So they're, they're different criteria. Now, the only rule out is biopsy, and there's only one case in which that's ever done as a screening test for healthy people, and that's when they're potential liver donors. You know, making up a scenario, say that we were uh, fraternal twins and that uh, I had a bad liver, you were going to give me a chunk of yours to help me get by. So you'd have to go through a whole lot of testing, make sure that you had a you know, good body weight, you were not diabetic, there was no blood markers of obvious liver disease. You'd also need to get an ultrasound. After all those steps, if you were a perfectly healthy gal with no signs of problems whatsoever, they would say, okay, last thing, we need to have you do a biopsy to make sure your liver is good for your brother. <laughs> and in situations exactly like that, 38.5% uh, of healthy adults with clear ultrasounds, normal liver blood tests, non-diabetic, not overweight, 38.5% of them cannot donate tissue because they've got advanced fatty liver disease. So it's, it's a big thing. My goodness. And we're going to, of course, talk a lot more about how can you, as a listener or a viewer of this interview, figure it out for yourself, given that it's clearly missing the boat when you go for testing. Now, I'll give my own example. I was tested when I had my second health crisis, and they said, no, nope, no issues. Your liver's just fine. And down the road, when I healed myself, of course, the first thing I did was to fix my liver because the alternative doctors, the integrative doctors were all saying, it's your liver, you need to fix your mm -hmm. liver. And I'd say, no, no, look at this, it says I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And they were like, toss that piece of paper out. Your liver is messed up, clean your liver and you know, half of your 28 symptoms will go away. And sure enough, I cleaned out my liver and of course we're gonna dive right into that next. Hey, check this out. So look back at some of your old tests. One thing I like to talk about, this is not a perfect rule in, but it catches a lot more. So there's two common blood tests. There's GGT and ALT. and Anytime you get any blood tests, they're, they're pretty much always part of that. They're like the most routine, basic test that there is. So they're not exotic. And GGT, there's not a gender difference. Normal range goes up to 40 to 60 per your region. Anything above 30 is suspicious for liver problems. Now, a bigger wrinkle is ALT. This is alanine aminotransferase. So this is called a liver enzyme. And it's an enzyme the liver uses to convert some amino acids to others. And the, the idea is that it's inside of liver cells and liver cells quickly are dying and regrowing. Remember, it's very regenerative. And so there's always some ALT floating in the bloodstream from old liver cells that popped open. But when there's too much, we know there's too high of a rate of liver cell death going on. Now here's the big wrinkle. So labs generally say that you're normal up to about 43, some say 65 based on your region. If you are a woman, your ALT score is greater than 18 there is no debate amongst liver specialists that something is wrong. Wow. And you're so far down in the normal range at that point. Now, fatty liver is not the only thing that causes that, but barring less common causes like a medication reaction or a hidden virus like hepatitis, that's by default what we think of when a woman has an ALT score above 18. Super common thing on the tests. Chapter two, the liver holds the key. So if all the organs you believe that it's the liver. Tell us why, and then we can dive right into more. Well, talking about metabolism, it's the hub of that. You know, it's, it's almost like when we left, when we were in the ocean way, way, way back when in evolutionary time sense, there was a point in which we couldn't regulate our internal chemistry at all. You know, we, we, we had to vote with our feet in terms of changing our chemistry. We had to get to where the water was good, you know, or drift or hope that we ended up in an area where the water is favorable. But when we left, we got the capacity of Internally, we brought seawater with us more or less, but we internally filter and regulate that with our liver. So our, our blood sugar, our hormones, our immune response, our body's fuel capacity, they're all regulated by that. And the gut has gotten a lot of very deserved attention, but the liver is the point of the port of entry. So things in the gut are not really in your body until they enter your bloodstream. And the first stop is the liver. And there's a group of cells that are there called cupper cells that are specialized immune cells. And they look at what's coming in and they say, hey, is this okay or not? How does the immune system need to work because of all this? 
And that's the thing. They don't teach this important part that liver is actually where everything you eat and digest gets into your bloodstream. Yep. It's really that gatekeeper. So if it's not performing optimally, you're not performing optimally. Mm -hmm. And it's across the board. Um, let's talk about fatty liver for just a moment. So liver is the key. We know that there's a fatty liver epidemic. We know it's underdiagnosed. What causes fatty liver and what is it? You know, so we define that by a liver that has more than 5% triglycerides by mass. So liver stores fuel in two ways. There's one type called glycogen, one type called triglyceride. And I think about this almost like, a, you know, I've, I've camped and I love to backpack, but a lot of times I'll camp, you know, with the vehicle nearby. And especially if my wife is with, she doesn't like to backpack as much. And so, you know, you make a campfire and you've got some logs where well, you need matches and kindling to get the logs going. And same thing for your liver. So the logs here, they're triglycerides. They're a very slow burning concentrated form of fuel, but they're hard to break down. And the kindling and the matches, that's glycogen. So it's not as powerful. You can't get as much energy from it, but it ignites more easily. So you need a certain ratio of both of those to break down the triglycerides. So in the case of fatty liver, it's quite simply, the triglycerides have crowded out the glycogen. So imagine that your campsite has so many logs that you, you left out the matches. There's like no way to light these logs. And the problem is that Anytime you get the slightest amount of extra fuel from carbs, fats, even ketones, even alcohol, a little bit too much means more triglycerides, but you've got no way to burn them. So it becomes this vicious cycle. It becomes that they get oxidized, they start to damage the liver cells, and it creates this disease process. So then you're not a fan of keto. Well, there's certainly some applications for it, which has been shown to be helpful, but the drawback for many people is that uh, ketones are not unusable by the liver for fuel. So if someone has a blockage of fuel already in the liver, they're, they're really not different. So, you know, ketones, fats, carbs, I wouldn't say any are good or bad. They're all different versions of fuel. And if your tank is overflowing, it's not going to help to take out the nozzle of unleaded and put in a nozzle of diesel. <laughs> it's just another kind of fuel. And yeah, fats, carbs, ketones, at the breakdown level, they're all the exact same thing. They're all oxaloacetate before they enter the Krebs cycle. And if there's too much for the body to burn, they all just get stuffed as more triglycerides. So th there's no free lunch by avoiding carbs or doing ketones. It it's all the same problem still. So I'm going to use myself as an example just because I went through this pretty significantly and I learned so much more about you know, how everyone's liver is different and clearly my liver is smaller and I had a Krebs cycle problem and I wasn't, um, you know, processing things correctly. And of course it was creating this cyclical problem, which quickly spiraled out of control. So what I learned and what I'd love for you to shed some light on is that figuring out your liver and what your liver is capable of is just so paramount and watching out for liver symptoms. So in my case, for example, I'm not a meaty, I was a vegetarian all my life. So for those of you listening, watching, saying, yeah, liver's not a problem for me. I'm a vegetarian. Not true. I was a vegetarian all my life. And yet I did have fatty liver based on just the symptoms. So what food groups cause fatty liver or what kind of dieting or food intake results in creation of fatty liver, even if it's not actual fat, like, you know, I wasn't having lard by the spoonful. Yeah. So that's the thing. It's a buildup of triglyceride. And any food type can form triglyceride when it's above what the body's needs are on an ongoing basis. And people often see a slippery slope towards the calorie discussions. And I don't really align with the calorie discussions because protein and then some fiber constituents are different. They're not the same from the rest of this. But carbs, fats, ketones, alcohol, they all can make fatty liver. And funny thing, you know, strong case in point. So people talk a lot about fructose as being especially harmful for the liver because mm -hmm. the liver is the first place to metabolize it. And when you look at all the studies, you know, it's animal studies and there's studies that have clearly shown that yes, high fructose intakes completely cause fatty liver in animals and, and probably similar things in human. But when they take the same animals and they'll take a diet that's 20, 30% fructose, but the total food intake is now not in excess, there's no more harm to the liver. And the same diet, if you take rather than fructose, you add 10% of saturated fat above the total food needs, you'll cause fatty liver just as easily. So there's really no food that's inherent, I'm sorry, besides things like trans fats or stuff that's a synthetic, that's right. or, or alcohol, but, but yeah, food that our grandparents ate, none of them are inherently harmful. 
It's only when they're above and beyond what the body can utilize. And it's not even just overfeeding. It can be underutilizing for various reasons as well. Like not moving from your desk because you work on a computer all day long and you just don't need to move as much, which is why I think all those recommendations around you know, walking 10,000 steps, et cetera, makes so much sense because you're trying to use up this fuel that you're taking in. That's a great point. You know, and what happens there is there's a condition called IMAT or intermuscular adipose tissue. And it's like the kissing cousin of fatty liver. They almost always go together. So the muscles do a lot to help the liver have a place to store more fuel. And there's sarcopenia, which is more of an age-related muscle loss. But IMAT is not age-related. And just like you said, you can grab someone who's in their 20s, but they've been doing office work for the last several years, look at their muscle tissue, and it's full of, full of fatty triglycerides, and it's got no more place to store extra fuel. So that's, that's one big factor. All right, chapter three, heal your liver. Let's get started. What do we need to do? What's the plan? Well, there's a couple of things that take some nuance. So one trick is that, remember, we've got all these logs, but not enough matches. So we've got to lower the fuel intake. We've got to do it in a way to where we're helping to support the liver still. The pitfall about, you know, you could think, well, just, just fast and quit eating and let the liver burn it all up. And it seems logical, but right. the drawback of just simply plummeting food intake is that you know, your liver needs stuff to keep on working. It needs essential amino acids for its own purposes, also to bind and shuttle the waste that it needs to get rid of, and that needs a lot of micronutrients. So we've got to get fuel lower, but then still get all the importance that the liver needs to take care of all that. So what is the plan? How do we heal the liver? You know, I did a program that we've done several clinical trials on, and it's comprised of a low fuel diet. So carbs, ketones, fats, they're all diminished, but we're supplying protein. And there's a lot of ways one could do this. A pitfall about protein is that when there is a quick breakdown of fat, there is also a release of uric acid in the body. Mm -hmm. And some can be prone to have inflammatory effects from that, you know, obvious things like gout or just general metabolic stressors. So I wanted to have less of a pH load from the protein. So I focused more on plant-derived proteins and spread them out rather evenly throughout the day so there's less work on the liver to have to regulate blood glucose. So yeah, I'm not lowering food too much, but enough to really start to break into the stores. And then also I thought a lot about, you know, what are some foods we can focus on that provide a lot of the phytonutrients that activate some of the liver pathways needed to just shed these, these toward, stored toxic fats. What do you think of herbs? There's all these liver detoxes that are available out there. You know, of course, things like milk thistle are touted as well. What are your thoughts on those? You know, they certainly have their, their place. There's things they can help. I, I, someone was asking me about a liver supplement, and it was a funny thing. I was talking to a group of people doing our, our reset diet, and they were asking about a liver supplement that we sell. And I said, look, right now, that, that's not something you need, it's not helpful. So the main cause of these problems is this fuel overload. So imagine you're walking along, and uh, like you're, you're, this campfire now, imagine you're walking along on a campfire, and say you're not at a Tony Robbins event to where it's working, <laughs> your feet actually are burning. So there's a lot of supplements and herbs that are kind of like thick sneakers. You know, they're kind of like things to protect your feet. And that's cool, but you could just like not walk on the fire. Because <laughs> 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 the core issue okay. is inflammation from the triglycerides. So if you can okay. spread those out, then it's all good. So there's no herbs that are going to go and accelerate exit of those triglycerides is what you're saying. You just got to cut down not. your there's a, there's a lot of them that do lower the oxidative damage. There's a lot of data about various things that lower the oxidative damage in fatty liver. Totally valid. Yeah. But yeah, you can just put the fire out, you know, then, then you're good. Okay. And the fire out is again, like move more, eat less. And eat, well, eat less, less, but again, it's a pitfall. If you just lower the food intake, but don't feed the liver, then right. you drop a lot of muscle mass right. and the liver is just right. further stressed. All right. Chapter five, foods to heal metabolism reset. All right. What, what are we talking about here? What foods are you going to feed us? So lean proteins are great. I did rely heavily upon plant proteins for these purposes for the pH effects. One food category that's not talked about a lot, but it's a big superstar for liver health, is a thing called resistant starch. And what so, is resistant starch? Yeah, pretty cool. So, so carbohydrates, you know, they give us about four and a half grams of energy per, four and, a half, uh, four and a half calories per gram of mass. And then fiber, it's a category of things that feed the flora, but is non-caloric. 
and actually can even bind up and take out some minerals from the body. Resistant starch is like the best of both worlds. So you get fuel from that, but not in the normal way. You know, normally we absorb food in the small intestine, the liver gets it, we make energy out of that. Resistant starch, first our good flora consumes it. And some of the best protective types of flora like bacteroidetes, they, they love this stuff, they thrive on it. They make tons of short chain fatty acids like butyrate and acetate. And this stuff heals the gut, benefits the immune response. But then they give us the leftover fuel. So we get about two calories per gram. But since it's coming from the large intestine, there's none of this blood sugar fluctuation that goes on from typical food. We end up with about like six to nine hours of completely flat, stable glucose from that. Mm. And one big part of the liver's job is regulating blood sugar. So when that's present, there's much less work the liver has to worry about for keeping the blood sugar stable. And isn't keeping blood sugar stable like the holy grail these days, right? Everything you know, from diabetes to heart disease to inflammation to weight, they're saying just keep your blood sugar stable. Well, and the funny thing is that the old ideas around all those things, including diabetes, was that <clears throat> you know some foods absorb fast, if they contain carbohydrate, they spike your blood sugar, they spike right. your insulin. You, know, you have a meal that's high in carbohydrate that happens afterwards, that was the old thought. Right. So, we now have the ability to differentiate your blood sugar from two sources because blood sugar comes straight into your bloodstream from your, your diet, but also it comes in from your liver releasing it. And what we now see is that those who are in the continuum of diabetes, about 80% of their blood sugar that elevates after meals has nothing to do with their diet. They've not that's even started. Right. Nope. It's all with their releasing. So yeah, about 15%. Say that again, because I, even I didn't know this. So, <laughs> so it's called postprandial hyperglycemia. It's high okay. blood sugar after a meal. And yeah, yeah, the old wisdom was that you eat carbs, carbs turn to sugar, sugar right. spikes, spikes your blood sugar, that's what people say. Right. But we can tell better now. And so when someone eats a meal, if they're metabolically compromised, mm -hmm. way before they've absorbed any real caloric content from that meal, their liver overreacts to a signal and their liver knows there's food coming. But remember now, the liver is so chock full of fuel already, it's just trying to dump ballast. So the concept in diabetes research is called leaky liver. And the liver is so full of fuel, it's just like pouring out fuel at the first sign there might be more coming in. Oh, wow. You know, we diagnose diabetes by morning fasting glucose elevations. That's not after a meal. That's what your liver That's released true. when you were sleeping. That's true. That's true. So very interesting. And I always thought that, you know, I had to manage the sugar in my meal, but you're saying actually that has nothing to do with it. I mean, the problem's already persistent. So you know, having said all that, there certainly are foods that are highly refined that are a larger fuel load. But of people course. often conflate sugar, meaning just carbohydrate in general, right. with sugar to what a baker would call sugar in recipe. <laughs> right, right, right. Very right. different. And there's always that question, Dr. Allen, right? is an apple versus a slice of bread versus a bowl of rice. Yeah. You know, so how would you rank them? Yep. To a chemist, you could call all those sugars. Right. A baker would not call those sugars. Right. You can't take rice. Well, what does the rice. liver say? Huh? What does the liver say? The liver just only cares how full it is. <laughs> so so if, if it was, let's say, not yet completely full, like there yeah. was a little space, yeah. would there be a difference in how the liver would process an apple, a, a slice of bread, or a bowl of rice. The liver could do well with any of those things when it has room for fuel. Interesting. So, so it really is all food is equal unless your liver is screwed. And if it's screwed, it doesn't matter if it's an apple or not. You need to help your liver first. There's lots of variables with food besides the energy equation, for sure, how it affects the flora, the micronutrients. But down to the energy equation, that's spot on true. It, it is a matter of how your liver is responding to it. Okay. Okay. So is intermittent fasting one potential answer in that algorithm we're looking for? You know, I've looked at a lot of studies on intermittent fasting and talked to a lot of folks that are advocates of that in great detail. And for many people, it's a convenient way to, to spontaneously consume less fuel. But what I hear is the promise of intermittent fasting is that if you time your food intake, somehow your total food intake becomes less important and the timing changes how your body responds to it. And that's been studied really thoroughly and found not to be the case. So if someone does do intermittent fasting mm -hmm. and they end up eating less food, it's gonna make this up, they end up eating 20% less food, 
they will see the benefits they would see had they eaten 20% less food, you know, no more, no less. Got it. But if they're intermittent fasting and not eating less food, they see no real benefit from that. And if they're intermittent fasting and consuming more food, they see the detriment they would get from consuming more food. Okay. Yeah, so if someone finds that they spontaneously eat less food on that, totally cool. But there's no data saying that if people are struggling, this is a way that will help independent of their total food intake. So I intermittent fast and I in fact feel I eat more food now than I did when I ate kind of grazed all day. I feel when I grazed all day, I just always ate kind of little portions because I had a small stomach. Because I intermittent fast and I kind of put myself in a window of five hours, six hours of feeding, mm -hmm. I go into this feeding frenzy. And I'm like shoveling food because I know, hey, I'm not going to eat after 7 p.m. or 7.30 p.m. Like that's it. And then I'm going to pick back up next day. And I think subconsciously, psychologically, I personally feel like I eat more. But also I eat a lot of food in a small window. Does the liver care about that? The fact that you're processing so much more food in a smaller window versus getting smaller dosage of food all day long? You know, again, when you're healthy and things work right, anything you do is totally fine and it's all great. Uh, when someone's liver is strained, the more work the liver has to do to regulate blood sugar, the harder that is on it. And when there's large gaps with especially no protein coming in, yeah. then there is more of a demand for cortisol to elevate and pull proteins out of muscle tissue to supply those needs for the liver. So that's a concern for someone who's metabolically compromised is they may lose more muscle mass by long gaps with waiting protein intake. And this is why I feel like there's such confusion in science out there because I just heard a podcast um, a couple of days ago about how when they did intermittent fasting on, on rats, they found that the rats had higher muscle mass mm -hmm. while doing nothing different, not moving more, not eating nope. differently. No confusion whatsoever. Rats and people are different in many ways. When you come down to basal metabolic rate, we have the most dramatic differences. A, rat, I, that, a rat that misses a meal for two days will die. You know, they have such different metabolic parameters than humans do. So, yeah. So I always look more at human studies to get to put more weight on to figuring things out. And so I wish people would stop quoting rat studies out there and defending certain fads or certain well, trends. You know, a little, little nuance on that. If there's no data whatsoever, then you can look down to lower level data and, and make speculations. That's reasonable. You wouldn't yeah. put a lot of weight on them, but you could say this may be how things work out. And also there's data that's prescriptive and data that's restrictive. So data that says, hey, this should work or data that says this is dangerous. So right. when there's not a lot of data, da data that suggests danger at animal studies is worth paying attention to. And we've got animal studies showing that rats doing intermittent fasting have higher rates of diabetes and damage the pancreas from that. So, so yeah, that's shown up too. Interesting. So there's, as you know, Dr. Walter Longo has written a book and talks a lot about um, fasting mimicking diet and that sort of a treatment for a lot of people with a chronic disease, but a lot of it is, is, and I've done it, I've done the prolonged diet. And, but based on what you're sharing, if, if I'm a severe diabetic and I do the prolonged type of fast, I'm not saying that fast, I'm saying if I do an intermittent type fast where I'm restricting myself to a larger volume of food in a smaller time frame, that's clearly going to put a lot more pressure on my liver in addition to the fact that I'm not eating longer periods, which means it's gonna create far more sugar spikes, I would think. You know, the concept is, is hormesis and stressors. So think about like exercise. So mm -hmm. if someone, uh, if you wanna build muscle, you've gotta challenge the muscle, but you can't overtax the muscle. So the idea behind something like intermittent fasting is that you're challenging the body's blood sugar regulation to make it stronger. And if it's up to that challenge, it may be helpful, but if it's compromised and, and has a difficult time doing what it's doing already, Sometimes it can just be a stressor. And yeah. so far, as far as like outcome data, we don't have a lot of real human outcome data. We have some human data about biomarkers, but so far the only real outcome data showing pathology has been from animals. So if someone, again, if they did it, they spontaneously ate less food, they got healthier, totally cool. But I'm always trying to figure out how things work and how can we help those who have tried everything and nothing else works. And this goes back to sort of, you know, disclaimer for everyone who's listening or watching this, you've got to figure out what is right for your body. Um, don't blindly follow whatever fat or trend is out there because it really may not be right for you. And you always want to get someone who's a professional involved in making sure that they're tracking their blood work and tracking your numbers to make sure that you're not going the other way and falling off a cliff. Even though everyone's saying intermittent fasting is great, maybe it's not great for you. And I know there's been a couple of doctors who've come out and said intermittent, intermittent fasting for women 
is very different because it messes up with our hormones, which by my age, close to 50, are already messed up. So, you know, my body doesn't need any more stressors. It's got enough stressors already. All right, next chapter, chapter six, reset lifestyle. What is all that about? This is pretty cool. So there's a lot of data saying how, you know, sleep is critical to good liver function. And this is funny. This is stuff that comes, was talked about in traditional medicine quite a while ago, and now we've got more data validating that. So one of the main variables about healthy liver function is this ratio of glycogen to triglycerides and having enough, to, enough kindling to light the logs, you know. And it turns out that our, our livers have a pattern of doing better at forming glycogen during prolonged, uninterrupted periods of sleep. And if sleep is outside of certain windows of time or if it's broken quite a bit, or if there's not a healthy cortisol break, like a shutoff of cortisol during deep sleep, you know, cortisol pulls glucose out of the liver. So if cortisol is still there during the sleep cycle, there's not enough glucose for the liver to form new glycogen. So yeah, so sleep quality is super important for that. So part of this chapter is about actually sleep binges and like identifying what your sleep debt is and paying that off again. <laughs> I love the sleep vacation that you talk about. Share a little <laughs> bit about that recommendation. I thought it was so cute. I'm, I'm going to be taking one of those soon. You know, the, the idea of sleep debt is a real thing. And people often think, well, I've been behind for a while. I'll catch up tonight. Well, no, it's, you can't catch up tonight if you've been behind for years. So I've had many people in that boat to where I felt that their chronic lack of sleep was obstructing their health. And I've encouraged them to take a long weekend and hunker down in a hotel room and you know bring some food with you, whatever, but do nothing but just sleep as long as your body needs. And don't, don't keep yourself stimulated or activated otherwise. And it's just how amazing how life-changing that can be for someone. Oh, very much so. I love the idea about going into a hotel and um, shutting down the television or giving away the remote because those things are addictive. <laughs> You know, I would, I would add in there, turning off your cell phone or giving that away. Yeah. That, you know, I can, I can look like this and two hours later, I'm like, I, I did nothing but stare at a little screen and I lost two <laughs> hours out of my very precious day. So please guys, if you know, pick up the book, there's some incredible amount of tips and things that you can do that you can actually do to reset that lifestyle. Any other tips other than sleep? What other one or two changes that you would recommend like pretty much everybody needs to make? Well, I don't want to preempt my next chapter. I'm going to take a peek here. Um, sure. In the lifestyle, yeah, I did talk about this in this chapter as well, was the idea of exercise. So the best thing in the world for your health is to move a lot and move often and move in many different ways. You know, strength, flexibility, agility, uh, endurance, ideally proprioception, balance. You would challenge all those things regularly. Now, during this reset process that I propose, think about it like, you know, balancing a, balancing a checkbook, you know, balancing some finances that were out of line for a while. And you wouldn't want to really be doing a lot of spending while you were doing that. So we want your liver to be able to rest. We want your body to be able to function in a lower fuel state and not have that be inherently stressful. So I lower activity. Now, the first week, we take that down to very little. Then weeks two through four, we do what I call micro workouts. And these are enough to activate GLUT4 receptors to keep your muscles engaged. And so at the end of it, you've not lost fitness, but you've let your muscles and your liver rest and heal in ways that just completely transform them. And I like that because I think someone like me who pushes myself on a daily basis, I work out like close to six days a week and I don't feel good if I haven't done, you know, an hour walk and an hour elliptical. You gave me permission to kind of put it all away and uh, maybe do some high intense training kind of, you know, 10 minute, 15 minute spurts. Again, I don't think a lot of people realize that when you work out, it creates burden on the liver. When you're healthy, it's the best thing in the world. But when you're trying to reset that and change that, it can get, it can get in the way of it. Right. So sleep, workout, anything else? Those are the main parts of the lifestyle, for sure. All right. Sounds good. All right. Next chapter. We're getting to all the fun stuff now, which is chapter seven, shake recipes. All mm -hmm. right. What's the shake you have every morning? Um, I do a blend of resistant starch with, with Give us paper. an example of a resistant starch, by the way. Uh, some food examples would be boiled potatoes, uh, white beans, uh, maybe northern... Potatoes? You're giving yeah. us permission to eat pototatoes? <laughs> Aren't they like the worst thing on the menu? Um, quite the opposite. Uh, high in resistant starch. So one, one case in point would be satiety. You know, how much a food fills you up per its fuel load. So there was a big study done very well 
in which they had a large group of people come into this room and they had them rate their hunger when they came in. And then they were they meant to be hungry. They hadn't eaten for a while. And they gave them all measured quantities of different foods. Mm. And then afterwards they observed how soon they were hungry and how much they ate after, after they chose to, you know, how long it filled them up for. And they crunched a ton of numbers from all this and they created a satiety index. So the same fuel load, the same calorie count of a food, how long does one fill you up longer than others? And fat was, in general, foods that were highest in fat were the least satiating. And you know, there's not a lot of volume there. So yeah. foods that had quite a bit of volume, especially those that had protein, starch, fiber, they were among the more filling. And foods are pretty much on a continuum. So you had like, you know, oatmeal and um, codfish, oranges were out here. Then you got potatoes. So numerically, the highest foods were in the low 200s. And then all by themselves, potatoes were in the mid 300s. Wow. There's, there's no more. One of, the, one of the worst foods for satiety is potato chips. But the highest food ever for satiety is boiled potatoes, and they're high in resistant starch. Oh, that's such good news. And sweet potatoes are really good, right? Yeah, and sweet potatoes. They're wonderful foods too, yeah. They're not high in resistant starch, but they're very good foods for lots of reasons. So what else is high in resistant starch? So I, I didn't realize that. I thought yams also would be high in resistant starch. So, so nope. potatoes, what else? Yeah, so potatoes. Then the other categories we'll see will be bananas and plantains. Mm. Now, funny thing here, they're higher when it's not ripened. Uh, you can cook them, but you want to start out unripe. So what would you put in your shake? So you've got a resistant starch of some sort. So would you yeah, put potatoes in your shake or would you put something different? No, I actually have a blend, a blended compound of resistant starch we made, which is a, a very validated to have set up of it. Okay. Uh, then I'll add in some pea protein and then just lots of random produce that I've got in the fridge. Uh, this morning it ended up being some frozen kale, some raspberries, some chia seeds. So that's a typical combination. Okay. Maybe some unsweetened flax milk or some just water. Yeah. And how, do you do one shake a day, a couple of shakes a day? So during the reset process, yeah, two shakes and one meal. Okay. I'm running right. a marathon next week, so I'm not eating two shakes and one meal right now. <laughs> 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 All right, chapter eight, dinner and unlimited food recipes. I did like this part of the program where there was a list of things you could eat unlimited, and carrots were one of those items. I, I was excited to see that on the list. But let's start with dinner so so it's two two smoothies of some sort two shakes mm -hmm. of some sort and um what is the proportion of fat protein carbs that you're aiming for in those shakes by the way in the shakes the main goal is to get at least 22 or more grams of complete protein and with the ingredients we end up with rather minimal amounts of carbon fat there's still some but they end up being not not as substantial okay and fat same, same thing, some, some there, but a smaller proportion, typically about like 20 to 30% of the calories in the shake. Okay, all right. And um, what about the meal? So what should the meal constitute? And is there a timing on the meal? Like you should be done by this amount of time? Yeah, several hours before bedtime. Actually, one people let their food spread out throughout the day, but a nice gap before the evening. And nothing too unusual with the meal. We've got some healthy, good carbs, small amounts of good fats, lots of veggies, lean proteins, and yeah, pretty simple proportions of that. So nothing too exotic. And a lot of folks even do really well with this while they're traveling. You can often get these meals while you're out and then just have shakes to bring with. So it's pretty simple. And do you subscribe to be a vegan, be a keto, be a paleo? You know, there's all these acronyms, the mm -hmm. DASH diet. Do you recommend following one particular diet? You know, we've made it so if someone is on a diet for various reasons like that, they can, they can do fine with it. Okay. Know? Got it, got it. So you're not insisting you've got to be this particular diet. So from a liver standpoint, if I'm eating red meat at night, you're okay with that on a keto plan. Okay. On a keto plan. So you, it, it, it won't work on a ketogenic diet. <laughs> okay, all right, now yeah, we're getting yeah. somewhere. Okay, so yeah. it will not work on a ketogenic diet, so no keto. Correct, yeah, paleo, the ones you mentioned, paleo, AIP, vegan, DASH, totally fine. But keto, ketogenic diets will not work for liver reset. That's very important to know. Given how many of us have a liver problem, I think it's really important to know that before anyone starts a keto diet, they really should double check on how their liver is functioning. So give us quickly, how can someone find out that someone who's watching or listening and says, you know, I wonder if my liver is healthy. What are some symptoms or signs or tests that you recommend? 
Yeah, great question. Symptoms and signs, you know, big thing is just energy is not there. You feel a need for caffeine or stimulants to get it up and get it going, especially morning or afternoon. Um, a big thing is just waist to height, both in terms of a symptom and in terms of a measurement. So lots of data around this being a huge predictor of health and liver function. So waist circumference really should be less than half of what your height is. So to be granular, uh, someone's five feet tall, making up an example, what, five times 12, 60 inches. So a five foot person would want the circumference around their belly button to be under 30 inches. So, yeah. Okay, so that's one. You gotta you know, measure up that belly and, and if it's, especially the problem is if it's a beer belly, you know you're in trouble already with the alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, which also brings me to, are you okay with alcohol on the reset diet? Nope, alcohol and caffeine are better. Okay. They're, they're avoided with our clinical trial, so not, not part of the reset process. Okay, dairy? Uh, dairy, is, dairy is an option for those that are not sensitive to it as a protein source. So yeah, a okay. couple of dairy types that are okay. high. So you're okay with dairy and gluten? Um, uh, glu gluten's avoided. Okay, so no gluten and no alcohol. Anything else that's on the no list? Refined sugars, yeah, trans fatty acids. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other symptoms? So fatigue and of course, circumference of the waist, the height. Um, we'll, we'll see gas, gas, bloating, um, irregular stools, uh, appetite being very erratic, unexplained pains in the soft tissues, headaches, especially right-sided or occipital headaches. So it's going to be strong signs of that as well. So I can imagine how many people are going, yep, that's me, that's me, nodding their heads. And so they're gonna walk themselves over to their primary care physician and say, test me, doc, I think I've got a liver problem. What are the tests that they're requesting? Well, they'll have to look at ALT and GGT okay. and have to know that the normal range doesn't apply. The numbers I told you before were, were female ranges for ALT. The GGT is same for both genders, it should be below 30. ALT should be below 19, 18 or under for women and below 30 for men. Okay, well, this, this is really good to know. And if you see those numbers and you know you're off, then of course, get on the metabolism reset diet, people. There's an easy, simple way that you can, you can fix this. Now the liver regenerates, right? That's the most encouraging part. It's like the best organ to screw up. You, you know, that's a good way of saying it. If you had to, it's, it's so important, but if something had to go wrong, you'd want something that can fix pretty well. They've done right. studies on those who have had severe liver damage from acetaminophen over overdose. Mm -hmm. And in some of the worst case scenarios, it's about 28, 30 days to get a brand new liver. A brand new liver in new 28 liver. to 30 days. Yeah. That's just incredible. So hence, hence your diet, right? So how long is your diet? In 28 days, no coincidence. 28 days, it's exactly. It's like, uh, you know, our health boot camps are 14 days and it's basically just two health boot camps pulled together. It's so <laughs> doable, so doable. And the best outcome of all of this is weight loss. Am I right? And it's sustained weight loss. So talk a little bit about the connection between the fact that we have an obesity epidemic, the fact that we know liver is under undiagnosed from a fatty liver standpoint, and the fact that your diet can not just fix the liver, but it's going to lead to weight loss. Am I right? You know, for sure. And a cool sign about things working well is when waste loss is more than you would think from weight loss. So a lot of charts will say that an inch around the waist corresponds to six to 10 pounds of body weight. But what we see in the program is that people will commonly lose two, three, four inches and five, 10 pounds. So if a person lost 20 pounds in one inch or two inches, they're not healthier. They've lost a ton of muscle mass. They're set up to regain weight and have issues. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna pause you. Uh, Last thing I mentioned was about just how we'll often see people have between two, three, four inches of mm -hmm. waist loss mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and perhaps five, 10 pounds of weight loss. And that's a hugely positive sign about them being in a better state. They've lost all dangerous fat tissue around and inside the organs, but they've preserved their muscle mass along the way. So that's a big sign of it being a successful endeavor. Exciting. All right. Last chapter that we're going to review here is maintenance chapter nine. So we've done the 28 diet days reset diet. We're feeling really good. What next? You know, that's a cool thing is that I've given a lot of general ideas for taking care of yourself and some suggestions to maintain that. But honestly, nothing is too unusual. And a lot of it is probably not outside of what people that are health minded are already doing. You know, when your body works right, you can do 80, 90% of things right 
and that remaining 10 or 20%, your liver will sort it out and you'll be fine. So the goal is to get you back to that place to where a reasonably good lifestyle becomes effective for you again. This has been enlightening. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. You're amazing to have written this book, to be out there sharing information about how critical it is that we get in charge of our livers. Any parting advice for someone who's listening? What is the one change you want them to make starting today? You know, the first change would be mindset and realization that anything you're chronically struggling with is not something that's attached to you like permanent luggage, that your body is so resilient and regenerative and things can get better. So don't, don't give up on that. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And for the rest of you, make sure you, you like, share, and tell everyone about the fact that their liver could be the cause of their weight issues and that there's a simple, easy way that they can fix it too, starting with yourself. So again, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to see you smiling on another one of these interviews. Thank you. All right. Good stuff.